John Chadwick of the Arlington Public School System. After John makes his presentation, we'll have opportunity for a few questions before we uh, take a little bit of a break and give people a chance to uh, stretch uh, uh, before we move into part two of the evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to carry on from where Lisa Grandel uh, uh, left off and <clears throat> remind you all that you're actually sitting in a high school this evening. Um, and that probably when you came in, you noticed that the parking lot was almost full. Um, as I go around the country and talk to colleagues, I find it's really unusual that there's a degree of use of school facilities and collaboration between county or city government or whatever it is in schools. And I think many of the people, many of Arlington residents maybe take it for granted and don't understand it is unusual and we're all to be commended for it. I don't think uh, we mentioned the three swimming pools, which are all in school facilities. I believe they open at 5.30 in the morning. I'm only up at 5.30 in the morning in winter mornings, um, so I'm not sure. I think they open at 5.30, they uh, uh, close at 9.30 usually, and they're open the weekend. So these are really great collaborations, and I think we're all to be commended for it. Um, we're very enthusiastic about the Orange Community uh, Facilities Study, and we think in the long term it's going to help us a great deal. We're also learning some lessons about how important it is to bring out a lot of information that people don't, ha don't necessarily know about. Um, in the short term, I have to say that we have a growing enrollment is really driving everything in the school system. It undermine, un, uh, underlies everything that we do uh, and drives everything we do at the moment. Last year, we had over 1,200 more students than the previous year. This year, we're projecting around 1,000 more. We will find out who shows up in September. Um, and so that drives everything we do. And because we're a public school system, we have to provide for them. If they show up, we have to educate them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our facility inventory, um, our vehicle inventory, because that really impacts space and our space needs as well, and the process we go through uh, to and repeatedly go through to address our facility needs. So most of our facilities are owned. Uh, there are only a couple which I'll go through at the end, which uh, we lease. Elementary schools, um, currently, uh, the maximum size preferred by the school board is 700 students plus whatever pre k classes are needed, one or two usually. Uh, and that means that that's the size that we would build a new school now if we were going to build, when we build a new school, would be around that size. We have um, 22, shortly 23, elementary schools. Um, please note that Carlin Springs and Campbell aren't actually in Fairfax. They are in Arlington. Um, and I think several people have remarked, looking at the map of county and school-owned land, that we have a series of schools that are pretty much equally spaced all the way around the boundary of the county. I think that suggests probably a time in the 1950s when people realized we need more school sites before all of the sites are developed. And that in itself illustrates the problem we all have, that there are no undeveloped sites available in Arlington County, or at least readily available. And when we look into that a little bit deeper, we tend to break the uh, elementary schools up into quadrants, uh, just for a way of organizing them. Uh, so I'm going to start out with the northeast quadrant, in which there are five schools. Um, what I would point out when we look at capacity, capacity is a number we use. In elementary schools, the actual number of students in the school that it accommodates, even if it's full, is likely to be less than the capacity we publish because the students spend most of their time in the same classroom and because some of the programs that we have in the schools uh, don't have a full class or have a smaller class size than the um, the 23 or 24 that we have. 
The key to these, these slides, and there's going to be a few more coming, is that it's green, means the school's within existing capacity. Yellow means it's uh, within 10%, and red means it's over 10%. So you can see here um, that we're projecting September 2015, so that's the start of the coming school year, and then September 2019, um, uh, when the 1920 school year starts. So you see there are a few schools here in red, and when you look down at the bottom, you see that um, we have a shortage of around uh, 350 seats in that quarter, uh, quadrant rather, in 2019. Uh, when you look at the Northwest Quadrant, you'll see that Discovery is coming online in September. Uh, that will have 630 seats. That was a smaller size this uh, school board had earlier approved. And uh, you can see that actually some of the red here is going to be addressed when discovery opens by the change in boundaries that's coming up shortly. You'll see that in that, in that one, in that quadrant, we have about 261 seats that we're short of in uh, 2019. When we go to the southeast quadrant, uh, there are only four schools there. And we are... Um, Currently about 200 short, and then in uh, 2019 we're about 600 short. Um, the uh, thing to note there is the very high number at Oak Ridge, which means that Oak Ridge is somewhat of a special case because there are so many students there and it is going to be so much above the standard preferred by the school board. When we go to the southwest quadrant, and th these uh, uh, overlap somewhat, you'll see that um, we, have a total, uh, we are missing about um, 500 students there. I'm sorry, not 500, 400 uh, in 2019. Um, and when we look at the totals on the next page, you can see that in 2019, we're short by um, about 1,200 students with more in the south or south of Arlington Boulevard than in north of Arlington Boulevard. And the point that I want, uh, that I need to make at this point, because it underlies everything that we do, is that we do not expect or project to build or provide in permanent uh, seats every seat that every a seat for every student that we're projecting. Um, we can't do that because we don't have adequate bonding capacity. We can't do it in time. And in fact, uh, if you look at the long-term uh, changes in in, in enrollment, they have always gone down at some point. So we do not want to be in the position of having to of having built too many schools or too many seats, and then having to give them back to the county like we did in the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. Middle school capacity, the preferred maximum size is around 1,300 students. They're all now the capacity for all of the, the middle schools is around 1,000 students. We have five middle schools now. Uh, we will be adding one in 2019 when the Stratford program opens. And the Wilson is shown because uh, that will be the home of the new HB uh, Woodlawn program. Uh, and that has, as you all know, has a middle school component. Uh, middle school seats, uh, you take a look at that, you will see that in 2019 we have um, only 300 seats uh, over, and that's because we are opening the new 1,000-seat Stratford Middle School in September of 2019. What I need to say about the middle schools and the high schools in terms of capacity is that number is much more fungible, and generally we can find that there are more students in the school than the, the capacity we publish. So when you look at those capacity numbers that everybody talks about so much, please remember that in the elementary schools, we're not going to get the full number in most of the schools because of the way we use them. And in the high schools and middle schools, we're likely to be able to get more students in them, and I'm going to go through that shortly. Uh, high schools, um, school board direction is a maximum of about 2,200 school students. The three uh, comprehensive high schools, like this one, are all around 1,900 students as the published capacity. 
as you know, we have three comprehensive high schools. We also have the uh, HB Woodlawn program, which has a high school component, the Stratford program, which is high school, and the Arlington Mill, which is not at Arlington Mill. It's very confusing. This is wrong. It's at the Career Center, which is probably why we need to think about changing the name, right? <laughs> um, and uh, then we have the Langston program as well. When you look at these numbers, they look to be a little bit more dramatic when you get to uh, 2019, because we have nearly 1,000 seats short. We are currently in the middle of a project at Washington Lee where we are doing some interior renovations, some technology improvements, some furniture changes to increase the capacity of that school by at least 300 students from around 1,900 to around 2,200 students. We fully expect within the next five years to do similar projects, possibly with less construction, at both Wakefield and Yorktown to increase them to at least 2,200 students. So that 1,000 uh, seat difference you're seeing or shortage in 2019 is more likely to be about 400 students. We have some other buildings. We have the Career Center, which currently accommodates the Career Center program, which is largely a pull-out program, some other programs, and then, of course, the Arlington Mill High School, which has a total of 327 students. The Langston Building accommodates about 64 students. Other facilities include the Education Center, um, which is about 55,000 square feet, the planetarium, which was renovated a couple of years ago, and the uh, trade center, which is uh, right next to and more or less shared with the county facility that George May presented to you earlier. Leased facilities, um, we don't have very much. We have 60,000 square feet. Uh, the Syfax Education Center, which is at Sequoia Plaza, um, right next to the county offices. We have the new directions and employee assistant program in the um, former funeral parlor on Wilson Boulevard, opposite um, Whitlow's on Wilson. Uh, and then we are starting to lease parking spaces around schools to minimize the amount of parking we have to build. So um, right now, we're, we're leasing um, some spaces at Ashlawn from the Dubinion Hills Area Recreation Center, I think it's called. And then we are also leasing some parking spaces in the structured parking garage that's between Columbia Pike and the Career Center. As we move forward with new, co uh, pro uh, new construction, New school projects, we continue looking at opportunities to share parking so that we can use parking spaces that maybe are not used during the day. We can use parking spaces that exist and, and therefore we can have more open space, more green space and less paved area. With them, two uh, synthetic turf fields. We're also rebuilding the uh, diamond field there too. This is a, a plan of Washington Lee, that the project that will start in the summer and then some of it will be done in the fall. This is really um, a very interesting project and I think it's the way forward. It's one of our strategies for um, accommodating uh, student enrollment growth. And as I mentioned earlier, we're doing a, a combination of interior renovations, furniture, um, much more flexible furniture so it can be rapidly changed, putting furniture in some of the um, uh, common spaces of the school where students can meet in groups or relax. Um, we're in creating a larger covered area outside because a lot of students like to eat lunch outside and that relieves the cafeteria for much of the year. And perhaps most importantly of all, we're creating um, a new type of um, professional learning workroom for teachers. And so that is to encourage teachers to work and collaborate with one another um, to come out of their classrooms for their planning period so that other teachers can go in there and to give them somewhere where they really want to do that. Uh, it took a little while to get them with the program, but they are really quite excited about it now. Uh, and it allows us to get those, school, those classrooms being used six or even seven periods out of the day rather than five periods. 
at the same time as encouraging the sort of collaboration around student performance that we're really looking for from our teachers. Uh, McKinley Elementary School is about to start construction to be finished in 2016 for the start of school in September. It will have 241 new seats and there is a fair amount of renovation of the existing building included in that, in that program. Abingdon Elementary School is, uh, the school board will see the schematic design on Thursday evening for that. Uh, it is scheduled to be completed in 2017. Abingdon only gains 136 new seats, so it doesn't exceed, exceed that 700, 750 maximum. Um, but it is having a major interior renovations and systems replacement because it, before enrollment started to increase and we started to need new seats, we were going through a period of renewing schools, which you sort of need to do around every 20, 25 years. And Abingdon was actually the next school in line to have that happen. Then, of course, we have Stratford Middle School, uh, scheduled to be completed in 2019 with a total of 1,000 students. Um, I'm sorry, it was Stratford Junior High School in 1959 when this uh, shot was taken of the of famous event there. And then, of course, we have the HB Woodlawn and Stratford programs in the new building on the Wilson site. The, um, the Wilson site is actually, I don't think this is working, but it's the uh, southwest uh, corner of that uh, property. Uh, this being part of the old, whole over, overall RAPS uh, planning study area. That will open in 2019. It will have a small increase in about a 10% increase in the number of students at HB Woodlawn uh, for a total of about 775 seats on the site. So um, projections show that we need more facilities and we're going to continue to need more facilities as long as our enrollment increases. We need a new elementary school in South Arlington, where to put it is a much bigger question, as is how that school will actually address the capacity issues we do have south of Arlington Boulevard. Middle school seats will be addressed by the new Stratford School, and that will, uh, we will handle middle school growth for some time. We are also looking at some of the middle schools to see if we can increase their capacity through similar measures to what we're, we're going to be doing at Washington Lee. It's a little harder to do because of the way in which the middle schools operate in, in grade level teams. Um, we, as I mentioned, we're going to be doing internal changes at the other high schools um, to provide additional ca capacity. And as most of you probably know, the CIP that was approved by the school board in June of 2014 um, funded in the future changes to the career center to turn it into a capacity generating high school. We're probably with a career and technical education focus. Relocatable classrooms, I'm sure you saw in what I had on the, uh, on the slides, how many relocatable classrooms we have. They are, uh, they fill a short-term need, and they're going to be a part of the solution to our needs as long as enrollment is growing. And they also give us that cushion against building too many seats for when that enrollment um, begins to decline. We have limited options for sites uh, to construct new schools because we're a fully developed county. Um, and that is an interesting problem in itself. And enrollment growth exceeds our debt capacity to build permanent seats. Let's talk briefly about our vehicles. Um, we have school buses. You might have noticed them on the roads. Um, we have a similar issue to the county all of our school buses are parked at the Trade Center, which is in Shirlington, which is in the one corner of the county. So that means that any routes that are in the north of the county have to start from there, go all the way up to wherever they're going, and then come back to the Trade Center during the middle of the day, and then they go out again in the afternoon. They're also maintained and fueled at the Trade Center through a collaborative agreement that we have with the county. We are at capacity. Um, we're parking buses in the aisles. Um, bus, uh, bus drivers are generally assigned buses. It helps with ownership. 
kids get to know them and so on. Um, so it's not possible for us to park like in a municipal lot where the driver takes whichever is the first bus is available. Um, and as I said, locating all those vehicles in one space, in one location in the most remote corner of the county or one of the remote corners of the county is an issue. And as we move forward, just like the county, we're going to be looking to collaborate with them on locations in other parts of the county so that we're saving on fuel and we're saving on driving time and congestion on the roads. Uh, this is a summary of the buses that we have now. We have 168. I need to point out to everybody, because it took me a while to figure this out, that um, the same bus can accommodate 77 elementary school children because they're allowed to sit three to a double seat per the regulations and 51 middle and high school students because they can only sit two to a double seat. Uh, we are starting to really improve our um, special needs inventory. So we have some smaller buses and we have some even smaller buses and we're very much hoping to uh, purchase some MV1 um, vehicles which are specially designed for uh, persons with disabilities. They're terrific. You might have seen some of them. The county has them. Um, and we're doing some collaboration with the county on uh, getting students around. They accommodate uh, two wheelchairs. They have a great ramp that comes out. Um, one of the wheelchairs sits right up there next to the driver. There's a jump seat for an attendant and then there's space for three more students, either small students in car seats or so on in the back. So it means that um, we actually, if we have those, we'll be able to get a school bus for, or a school vehicle to any location. And there are some locations now where we just can't get buses. So we have 168 today. And obviously, as we get more students, we need more buses. So we're looking at about 180 by 2017. We have a white fleet. I think it's around 100 vehicles. That's um, You've seen the escapes and the trucks and the um, uh, box vans and so on. They are distributed. There is a small concentration at the Trade Center of the real service vehicles, but different departments have, um, have different vehicles and they tend to park where they are. Um, the APS GO initiative is our uh, plan to um, manage or improve on transportation demand management at schools. Uh, we want as many students who are as eligible, are, are eligible as possible to ride the bus. Um, so we're going to, we're really focusing on how do we get more students to ride the bus who are eligible and how do we get the, um, the uh, parents drive fewer parents driving their students to school. Um, that's what causes the congestion on the roads. It causes uh, congestion around the schools. And um, to put it politely, we can control the behavior of bus drivers because if they don't follow the rules, we take care of that. We can't do that with parents. I'll say no more. So there's really a, we're really working on an initiative to try to, to increase the utilization of what we have so we have to add fewer buses and so that we can reduce congestion around the school. That's not that we don't want to also encourage healthy walking and safe routes to school and biking and so on for those students who are able and want to. So some key takeaways around vehicles. Um, incre enrollment increases have a direct in a impact on the number of buses, much less impact on the number of white vehicle free. We do have issues at the Trade Center. We're running out of room and it puts all the buses in one more inefficient space. And APS GO is underway. Uh, there'll be a presentation to the school board next month on the next steps with that. So uh, briefly, how we determine our future needs. And we actually have this laid out in our policies and policy implementation procedures. And it's a process that we've uh, followed for many years. Um, Every year in the fall, Lionel White uh, does his enrollment projections. Uh, they are based on the number of students in the school on September the 30th. We do it again in the spring, uh, really based on January the 30th, and that is to really is used more for uh, looking at um, staffing factors. In 2009, the school board adopted, after a study by a group of consultants, the progressive planning model. 
and that was to find ways to increase utilization of existing buildings before we added re relocatables and before we constructed additions and built new schools and so on. So this is about how do we better utilize existing spaces. Um, it could include uh, class size increase, and there have been a couple of those in, in recent years. How do we refine boundaries so that we balance out students between schools so they're all equally full? And then, of course, it does include adding relocatables. And we continue to do that assessing how we can use our buildings more efficiently, as you've seen with the Washington Lee project. In the uh, uneven years, we do the Arlington Facilities and Student Accommodation Plan, and that really is a detailed analysis of our capacity needs um, uh, with a lot of background information and so on. In the even years, we do the Capital Improvement Plan, which is aligned with the county's 10-year uh, ten, ten plan. Used to be six years, now we're doing it for 10 years. And in that, uh, the school board identifies specific pro construction projects that we're going to do with the funding available for them and when they're going to be completed. Uh, so that's prepared every other year, and it's a cycle. So last year we finished the CIP, and actually we did some more work on it through December with the school board around decisions for Stratford and Wilson. Um, we're wrapping up the uh, AFSAT, we call it, the Arlington Facilities uh, and Student Accommodation Plan, for the end of this year, and then we're already starting to think about the CIP for 2016. So it's very much a um, thought out cycle. It's, as I say, it's written down in our policies and PIPs and we follow it rigorously. Um, I had to put this slide in because so many people ask us about commercial space and um, have we thought about commercial space uh, what are our thoughts? And I need to uh, just talk a little bit about the Bailey's Crossroads schools in Fairfax because I'm sure you've all heard about that one. And I need to give you a little bit of the backstory. It's a four-story suburban office building and they got it for $9 million in foreclosure. Those type of buildings are not available in Arlington. Um, they just aren't. We've actually regularly um, have people working for us to identify opportunities for buildings that we might lease, that we might think about purchasing, um, but those type of buildings are, just aren't available in Arlington. Also, it's a four-story elementary school, so it's three, four, and five grades. Um, per the Virginia guidelines, uh, pre-K, K, and I think first grade have to be on a grade level access, so they have to be on grade. Um, we, there, are limited, there are limited sites available. There are a limited number of buildings available in Arlington. The ones that are available are tend to be the older buildings, and they're quite small. That's one of the reasons why they're available. So um, some of them have about a 20,000 square foot floor plate. And when you get down to the ground floor, we've learned from talking to developers, there's not much space left because it's filled up with the lobby and the, the uh, delivery areas and so on, and maybe small retail. Also, in um, commercial buildings have very different code requirements from schools. So there are different fire rating requirements. Um, stairs tend to be much wider in school buildings because it's got a higher occupancy and smaller children. Um, and bathrooms are a problem in schools. In addition, gymnasiums become a problem in an office building because there are columns in the way, and there isn't enough height, and there's really that much space to build them. The school at Bailey's Crossroad opened without a gymnasium, it has some great exercise rooms, uh, but I believe they're now building one in the parking lot. Uh, also, many landlords aren't that keen on having school children in their office buildings because it might lower the rents and diminish the number of tenants they might get. And the other thing that we have to be really mindful of is if we lease space, it comes out of our operating budget. And as we all know, um, Enrollment is increasing at a greater rate than county revenues and the county revenue share that comes to schools. And so impacting the operating budget is a very serious concern. Uh, I, I put this one on because uh, we had had a question around the Title I schools. The Title I schools are the ones that are shown in green on this, um, on this slide. So, to conclude, I'm done. Uh, 
Enro enrollment increases do require additional facilities and, tra and transportation and parking. We have a formal process with our AFSAP and our CIP to evaluate and meet our, can, our uh, facility needs. Uh, the projects that we're planning to provide seats don't provide all the seats that pro the projections suggest. And as I've explained, there's a very good reason for that, two reasons for it. Um, we continue to focus on sustainable development and to collaborate with the county to evaluate sites. We care just as much about green space and open space as everyone else in the county. And we continue to um, work with the county and, and we're enjoying working with the Island Community Facilities Study to balance those needs in a fully developed county. Thank you. Thank you, John.